So it's good to see all of you here today, and if you're joining us online, welcome, but we're going to sing some songs here. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you who had said? To you for refuge, to Jesus hath fled. Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen and help thee and cause thee to stand. Omnipotent hand, the soul that on Jesus doth lean for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never. the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, Christ the blessed one gives to all. Wonderful words of life, sinners list to the loving call. Wonderful words of life, all so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for another day that we have to gather together. And Lord, I pray that you be glorified. Speak to us. God, help us as we recount how faithful you have been. And Lord, help us as we call out to you in prayer and hear your word. Uh, Jesus, I love you and I praise you in your name. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, good to see you today. Glad that you are here. Thankful to be here with you. Um, and so we want to start as we normally do. What are you thankful for? How has God blessed you this week? And then we do want to pray for each other and for the needs that are, are, are all around us. So how can we rejoice together? How, how has God been good to you thus far this week?
Amen. She says blessings are new every day. Amen. Hey, I want to tell you, I got to see Miss Delita Johnson yesterday. Um, much better, actually. Got to left Jacksonville yesterday, um, and after I saw her, they were trying to work through the process of getting her out. They got her out. They got her in uh, Waycross, uh, and she's there at the rehab by the by the airport. Y'all ever been? If you've ever been kind of around the back back there, there's a, there's a rehab back there. Uh, she's in room number nine, and so yeah, so she'll be there for a few weeks. Um, so thank God she's doing better. You need to pray for her, Mr. Troy. Also pray for him. He had a fall um, outside the hospital and really, really got beat up. I mean, just um, head, arm, ribs, shoulder. I mean, it was a bad, bad fall. And so thank God that it wasn't any worse because... You, know, you have a bad fall on the concrete and hit your head, it could be, it could be a really bad thing. So um, continue to pray for them, but thank the Lord she um, is out of St. Vincent's and they're in rehab. All right, something else you're thankful for today. mentioned, um, you know, we've got some storms coming in later today, but thankfully there was uh, where my family lived, my, Tammy's mom and dad live in Alabama, there was tornado warnings in their county, but thank God um, they were okay and no word of any deaths or anything around them, and so praise God for that. All right, if no more praise, um, how can we pray for each other today? What are some prayer needs that are on your heart? Um, what do we need to lift up together to the Lord? Obviously, continue to remember Mr. Eddie uh, as he has treatments, so pray for him. Um, pray for the Giddens family and for the Michael family. Both of them lost their homes in fires, so pray for them. Somebody else, other prayer needs today? Yes. My friend Barbara had a CNA today at her house, and she just walked off and didn't come back. Wow. So I stayed with her Monday night until her, her family was able to bring it together for them to pray day and mm -hmm. night. She just, she just wanted to stay at, she wants to stay in her house, the problem. And her daughter, I think, just keeps saying, talk to her into coming back to Blackshire because she, aside from dressing herself and, and walking around, that, she's very limited with what she can do at this stage. Um, and hopefully, well, with God's help, he'll, he'll find her the right team to sure. do what she could take care of her needs. Somebody else. else. Other prayer needs today. Somebody else. That's a serious unspoken need. Is there other un is there other unspoken needs? You don't really want to talk about them, but God knows there's a need on your heart. Lift them up for sure. Pray for our youth pastor search team as we continue the work um, to find our next person to work with this next generation. And so, um, hopefully, hopefully, have some news for you here soon. Yes. Yeah, it's funny. I, I really, I love, I love hanging out with the teenagers. We went not this past Friday night, but the Friday night before. We we took them over to Brunswick, went to Pinball Palace, and I just, I love hanging out with them. We had a great time. Had a good crew. Crew had 
19 teenagers that we took. Um, and so it was a great night. Um, and then I get home and I'm kind of moving a little slower than normal. I'm like, man, <laughs> I'm even coming back. I'm like, man, it's kind of late. It used to, I could be up midnight, 1 o'clock, not a problem. About 9, 30, 10 o'clock now, I have this condition where my eyelids get super, super heavy. I don't know what the deal is with it, but uh, yeah, so but they, they, they were a blessing. And so it was cool to see a um, lot of laughing, a lot of fun. And so pray we're... We're trying to do something with them every month, and then I'm planning, even though we're hoping to have our youth pastor here going ahead and planning a a summer trip for them, uh, because we don't want to leave them out, and we want to make sure they stay busy, and so we're trying to plan something for the summer and take them off, and so it'll be good, but but pray as we continue to search. Um. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Mr. Buster, I... I, I was a youth pastor for a long time and so loved working with teenagers, but the joke was always this amongst my youth pastor buddies. It was like, okay, you know, you got to have a lot of energy to go off with the kids, uh, but there is one a distinct advantage of going off on trips with senior adults, and it, it's simply this, you eat a lot better. With the, with the senior adults than you do with the teenagers. Teenagers are like, okay, wh- where's the most food for the least money? And... Senior adults are like, no, 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 we're not eating that junk. Let's eat. Uh, one place that's very popular is Cracker Barrel. And I love Cracker Barrel. So they're like, let's go to Cracker Barrel. I'm like, yes, we can do Cracker Barrel. Taco Bell, not so much. Um, so. She'll come home and visit. It'll be midnight on them. Especially on the weekends, I'm like, sweetheart, I, I have to preach in the morning. I got to go to sleep because I get up early on Sunday, real early, pretty early on Sunday mornings, and come in, and I'm so I'm here by myself and, and spend some time. But you got to go to bed. So, but yeah, so just pray, pray for our youth pastor, church team, pray for our students. Uh, pastor Justin will be preaching tonight uh, over there, and so a lot of times. I mean, look, you guys mainly are here on Sunday morning, Wednesday morning. I, um, I, I work with Awana on Wednesday nights. And then some, on the first Wednesday night of the month, I'm over speaking to the students. And so I kind of rotate around on Wednesday nights. And so, uh, but just, uh, just pray. I'm thankful for them. We got, we got some good kids. We do. We're blessed. So praise the Lord for that. All right, somebody else, some other prayer need tonight. Pray for our country. Pray for the people of Ukraine, both the people. Um, pray for the church in Ukraine. Um, what about lost your backslidden? you got folks on, on your mind that you're concerned about their spiritual condition. Right. Anybody else? All right, if not, let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for the day that you've given to us. God, we thank you for an opportunity that we have to gather. Um, and Lord, as I think about the situation around the world, I'm thankful not only that we are able to gather and without the fear of governmental persecution, I'm also thankful that we don't have the fear of, of ongoing war right here in our community. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And um, Thank you that you have shown yourself faithful and good and merciful to us. Um, Lord, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Uh, thank you that you bless us every day. You've given us the breath of life. God, you've allowed us to have friends and family who love us, a uh, church family, um, to worship and serve you in. And, and God, we just thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for how you've touched Mr. Levy. God, I thank you for being so merciful to her, for the doctors and nurses and other staff that have helped her, and family and, and friends who have ministered. And God, I just thank you for them. And I thank you that she was able to get over to, to Waycross. I pray for the folks there who are helping her. God, that you'd give them grace and mercy. 
Uh, God, help them to have wisdom, allow her body, her to regain her strength. Thank you for the progress that has already been made. And Lord, I pray that that would continue. Thank you, Lord, for protecting Mr. Troy um, in the fall. And God, we just praise you for that. Um, God, I pray you'll touch his body, allow him to recover. And uh, God, the pain to subside. I pray for, uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, the protection during the storms. Lord, so many were affected. Um, but God, thank you for protecting our, fr- our family and uh, many friends. Uh, God, I just thank you for that. I pray for those who have been affected. Um, God, I pray that you would just show yourself faithful and merciful to them. Uh, Lord, I pray for, uh, for Barbara. Um, Lord, I pray that you would bring in the right people to help her. Um, thank you for family and friends who are, are mobilizing to help her at this stage in life. And, and God, I just pray that you'd bring the right folks around, uh, the medical professionals that she needs to help, and and others. And, and God, I just pray that you would um, God be good to her and let her know that you love her. Uh, Lord, I pray for Linda uh, now with all the other that has gone on now facing um, the stroke. God, I just pray that you would give peace and mercy and grace. Um, thank you that you've promised that you'd never leave us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just draw near to it now. For this unspoken request that Mr. Buster's mentioned, God, I pray that you would move in that situation comforting thing is, Father, is that we, we don't have to know because you know everything. And that we, we, we may not be able to solve the situation on our own. But God, there's nothing that you can't do. And so Lord, I pray that you would wrap your arms around them today, that God, you would give clear direction, that you would provide, that you would protect, that you would move. Um, God, that you would bless and show yourself that Lord, I pray for our youth pastor search. God, I pray that you guide our steps. Thank you that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So, Lord, I thank you for the the promise that as we seek after you, our steps are ordered. You direct us. And that if any one of us lack wisdom, we can ask you and you'll give it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would guide our steps. I pray for um, the folks that we talk to, that you would... Help them to have discernment to know exactly what your will is. Lord, I pray for Mr. Eddie and Miss Kathy. Um, God, I pray for him as he undergoes the treatments. God, that you would, God, heal his body. And thank you for the work that you've done in his life. And thank you for Miss Kathy. I pray you bless them. For Mr. Jimmy and Mr. Dorinda. God, for Sean and his family and the loss of the home that they were living in. And for for Mark and Wendy, God, that you would touch them and comfort them. I know that you know insurance will try to rebuild the house, but Lord, I know there's been a loss. And as thankful as we are that you protected their body, I know that there's still grief when you lose you lose your pictures, you lose your family heirlooms. And God, I just pray you'd wrap your arms around both of those families and let them know that you love them and draw near to them and help them to draw near to you. Lord, I pray for our adult musical Sunday, God, that it would be a time of worship that glorifies you. Lord, that as we hear stories of people who, who you've shown yourself faithful to in the midst of difficulty and struggle and trial, God, thank you that you are the Lord and you change not. Thank you that you're not a respecter of persons, that what you have done for one, you'll do for us. And so, God, I pray that you'd help us to, to worship you in spirit and in truth and to, to be encouraged by stories of your faithfulness. Lord, I pray for our country. Your word tells us that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And as you look at what is transpiring around us, we have wandered far from our founding. God, I pray for our president. You'd give him wisdom. Lord, I pray you'd surround him with people who know you and love you. God, help them to do what is right. Your word is clear that there's woe to those who call good evil and evil good. 
And we confess, Lord, that that's the time that we're living in. Oh, God, be merciful. I pray for our first responders here in town, our local leaders. God bless them. I pray for the people in Ukraine and the church in Ukraine. I pray that this war would come to a quick resolution, that it would end. Lord, I millions displaced, thousands dead. God, give them grace. I pray for those who are lost in our sphere of influence, God, that we'd never get so content on the road to heaven that we'd forget about what you've done for us and we'd neglect to tell people about you. I pray you'd use us to point people back to you who have wandered away. Today I pray you'd help us, Lord, to speak to us to so dive into your word, you'd help us to hear your word and to do it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, if you have a copy of God's word, and I sure hope that you do, I invite you to grab it, please, and open the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16, you know, we're coming to the end of this book. Been a great journey. Uh, been about 14 months um, in this book. And so now we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians 16. We we remember last week we, we reminded you that 1 Corinthians 15 is this great theological treatise on the resurrection. And then he dives right into the offering. Um, isn't that appropriate? He, he says, listen, because God gave so much, we respond by giving. We respond by supporting the ministry and supporting the work of the kingdom. And then he comes to verse 5. And when you read verse 5, you've got to understand it's, it's framed in the context of the whole book. And, and notice... It's interesting. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And I believe this kind of sets the stage for what he talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So if you found your place there in 1 Corinthians, stand with me please to honor the reading of God's Word. We'll start in verse 58 of chapter 15. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And then he describes one way that they serve, one way that they make a difference in giving. And then notice verse 5. But I will come to you after I go through Macedonia, for I'm going through Macedonia. And perhaps I'll stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may send me on my way wherever I may go. For I do not wish to see you now just in passing, for I hope to remain with you for some time if the Lord permits. But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a wide door for effective service has opened to me. There are many adversaries. Now if Timothy comes, see that he's with you without cause to be afraid, for he is doing the Lord's work as I am also, as I also am. So let no one despise him, but send him on his way in peace, so that he may come to me, for I expect him with the brethren. But concerning Apollos, our brother, I encouraged him greatly to come to you with the brethren, and it was not at all his desire to come now, but he will come when he has opportunity. Father, speak in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, when you think about this context, notice Paul's admonition to the church. Did you see it? He says, be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Now notice this picture of, that Paul is providing for us. He says, as followers of Jesus, we ought to be busy about Jesus' work. Are you all with me? We ought to be busy about doing what God has called us to do. We ought to be busy. We ought to be giving maximum effort, working to the point of exhaustion, doing what it is that God's called us to do. Now, all of us have different callings. All of us have different giftedness. God has made us different so that he might make us one. He gives the different gifts in the church. Some have the gift of teaching or preaching. Some have the gift of help. Some have the gift of faith and generosity and evangelism. So we use all of these gifts together to serve God and to impact those around us. And notice when you think about working for God, there ought to be, uh, there ought to be a, a zeal. And you say, Ron, what is the key? What's two major emphasis? What, what are some things we ought to be doing? We ought to be loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving your neighbor as yourself. 
doing like Jesus, seeking and saving that which was lost. Now, it's interesting when you see Paul's picture here, he was working himself to death. G. Campbell Morgan said it this way. Uh, He said, Paul had in his mind the kind of toil that has in it the red blood of sacrifice, the kind of toil that wearies and weakens along the way. Somebody who's really getting after it for the glory of God. How many of y'all, did anybody y'all play sports when you were younger? You know, I remember our coach would always say this. He said, you get out there and you get after it. Uh, I remember a lot of times he would be, sweat! Don't love! He'd scream at you. And so he wanted maximum effort. And you, can, I, can I ask you a question? And this is just kind of an, an introduction what is it that you give maximum effort to? If you were to say, okay, Ron, here are the things that I do. Here's the activities that I'm involved in. Here's the, the things around my life. If you were to look at my calendar and see all of the entries, everything that happens, what would you say would receive the maximum effort? What are you most passionate about? I would argue that you ought to give the maximum effort to Jesus. He deserves your very best. Now, notice verse 5. We see this picture of someone serving God. And well, would you all agree with me that if there's any ever been a person who has served God effectively, Paul would be high on that list? I mean, if you walked through your Bible and you said, okay, let's name the people who served God. Let's name the people who made a difference. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody on the list. Obviously, Jesus is above everybody, okay? When, when I say this, understanding that Jesus is, he's not on the list of people who made a difference. He is the difference maker. He is the one who made all of it possible. Jesus is way up here, and then we begin to list out people who've made a difference. When you look at the Bible and you think of David and, and you think of um, Abraham and you think of Moses and you think of Joshua and you think of Peter and James and John, and you think of the Luke who wrote the majority of the content of the New Testament, you think of people who made a difference, you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody who made a difference greater than Paul. I would argue that Paul is the greatest Christian that's ever lived, most likely. He's the, the most preeminent follower of Jesus that, we're, that we know of, that we know of, Okay. So when you look at Paul's life, he begins to give us some principles on how to serve God effectively. And notice what he says, verse 5. Now, I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. You say, Ron, what do we learn from that? You know what I love about Paul is that Paul was very intentional about what he was doing. He had a plan. Now, the, the, things didn't always go to plan. Have you ever realized that sometimes the best laid plans don't go the way you plan them? If I were to ask you, if, if we could get in a, a DeLorean, now I can say that to this crowd, and you guys will understand. You say that to a teenager, a DeLorean, what's a DeLorean? But if you were able to hop into the DeLorean and go back in time, to then come back to the future, okay? You're able to go back in time and you could meet your 18-year-old self and you could say, you know what? Here's, here's some things you ought to consider. And you were to ask your 18-year-old self, what is your plan for your life? Would it be different than where you find yourself today? Would you say, you know what, things are different than I thought they would be. That didn't work out. If, if you'd have gone back to Ron at 18 years old, this is what Ron would have said. I'm going to be, at this point in my life, I'm 46 now. I just turned 46 in January, 46. I would have said, well, I'll be in probably about my 20th year as a, a corporate pilot, uh, most likely flying for a major carrier as the captain of a major airline. That's what I wanted to do. That was my plan, okay? It's funny, Tammy joked with me. She said, when we started dating, you were a piano-playing pilot. (laughs) Now I'm a preacher. The irony was, and I'll just say this, and I'll get back on the message. It's funny. I'll never forget when I told her that God had called me to, to ministry. She said, oh, I knew. 
I said, what do you mean you knew? She said, I, I knew that this was coming. I said, well, you know, it helped if you'd have told me a little while before. <laughs> but you think about it, your, your life may not plan, play out according to plan, but it's important to have a plan. And notice what Paul said. I want to come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. I love Paul because he's saying, listen, how can I take this gospel? How can I take the name of Jesus, the one who encountered me on the Damascus Road, the one who radically changed my life? How can I use my life for his glory? And Paul, I believe, was one who was steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. He was somebody who was saying, listen, I'm going to be strategic and intentional about how I live my life. Now, it's interesting, when Paul writes to the church at Corinth, you know that he's, he's in Ephesus. And so things are happening in Ephesus, but he's investing. He's saying, listen, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to minister to you. I'm going to make a difference there. Even though he was being used here, he's planning on how he can make a difference. All... He's being used here, but he wants to be used everywhere. So he says, listen, I'm serving here. I'm making a difference here, but I want to come to you, and I want to make a difference there. And when you think about Corinth, we've talked about this before um, this is a tough place. And Paul says, I want to invest in you. I want to make a difference in your life. Now, it's interesting when you think about kind of how all this kind of plays together. You see in Romans 15, Paul wanting to go to Spain. He wants to make a difference there. Did you know that Romans is basically a missionary support letter? He hadn't been there yet. But he's raising money so he can go. And, so, and I would encourage you, when we have missionaries come here, I want to invest in them. I think about Kevin and Cynthia. I want to invest in them. I want to pray for them, people who are making a difference. You think about William Carey. Uh, William Carey was a, a, a shoe cobbler. And right in front of his face was a map of the world. He wept over it. And he prayed, oh God. Think about David Brainerd. People who were stirred to make a difference. And so... If you're going to serve God effectively, you've got to be intentional. Can I tell you the second thing? This is something I always talk about when we go on mission trips. Not only intentional, can I tell you one of the keys in the Christian life? Are you all ready for this? If you're going to serve God effectively, you've got to be flexible. You've got to be flexible. Are y'all, are y'all understand that? You've got to be flexible. You can't be so rigid. Notice verse 6, and I love this. You know, when you think about Paul, you think about this stoic man, this determined man, and he's like, this is what's going to happen. But notice his honesty and humility and his flexibility in, chapter, in verse 6. This is what he says. And it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you that, I may, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. You see, Paul understood that, listen, I'm making plans. I want to come and see you. I want to go do things. But at the same time, I realize that it may not work out, that I may not be able to do what I have planned. He wants to stay with them. He wants to be there with them. He wants to journey on from them. But he says, listen, all of this depends on if the Lord permits. Now you say, Ron, how does this work out? I want you to notice something interesting. You're in 1 Corinthians 16. Turn one page over or so to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you, because you do realize... 1 Corinthians was written, then you got 2 Corinthians, so you have these letters that are written together. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we begin to see what happened after 1 Corinthians. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 15. In this confidence, I intended at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing. That is, to pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you, and by you to be helped on my journey through Judea. You said, now wait a minute. That's exactly what he just said in 1 Corinthians 15, 16. He said, I want to come to you. I'm going to pass through. I'm going to come. And he said, this is what I want to do. But notice how the people responded. Look at verse 17. Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? Or what I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, so that with me there will be yes, so that with me there will be yes, yes and no, no at the same time? 
But God, as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. Now, notice the picture, what he's saying. He said, listen, I wanted to come to you, but things happened. He says, I wasn't vacillating. I wasn't going back and forth. I wasn't speaking out of both sides of my mouth. When I told you my plan, this is what I wanted to do, but it didn't always work out like I intended. Notice, for the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Sylvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore, and also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. So you see Paul reminding them that, listen, I, I wanted to come to you, but I had to be flexible. I wasn't going back and forth. But plans changed. Turn back to, to Acts 16. You want to talk about flexibility. How many of you have ever made a plan and had a hard time adjusting the plan? <laughs> I, sometimes I get aggravated. If, if we make a plan, I just want to do it. You know what I mean? I want, uh, that, this is the plan. This is what we talked about doing. Let's just do it. But notice the flexibility that Paul mentions in Acts 16. And this is a great... Um, picture, and it's a familiar story. Has anybody ever heard of the Macedonian call, the Macedonian vision? Notice with me, Acts 16.1. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. But Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew his father was a Greek. Now pause there for a second. You say, Ron, why would Paul circumcise Timothy as a grown man? You know, because we often say, well, I'm not going to compromise anything. I, I, I know what's right. I'm, but notice, Paul didn't do this because it was a legal requirement he didn't do this because it was something that God said, because Galatians talks about that circumcision is nothing, but he didn't want to cause offense. He said, listen, I don't want to hinder Timothy's ministry, his ability to speak in the life of Jews, so we're going to go ahead and compromise on things that aren't critical. Notice verse 4, now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. You say, now what is that about? Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. You remember that. Uh, the, 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 the apostles had made a decree that, hey, listen, here's what we ought to do. And so Paul is distributing those. Notice verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith, and they were increasing in the number daily. They passed through Phyrgian and the Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. You said, now wait a minute. The Spirit told them not to go somewhere? He did. That's what it just says. No, go to number 7. And after they came to Mycenae, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So the Spirit again says, nope, don't go there. You see, they were heading one direction. God said, no, don't go there. And they head another direction. God said, no, don't go there. Keep on going. And passing by Messiah, they came down to Troas. Now, when you come to verse 9, we begin to see this picture of the Macedonian vision. But can I tell you something? How many of us, when God told us, when we wanted to do something, we thought, this is what we're supposed to do, and God said no? Well, I'll tell you what my temptation would be, to sit down and pout. Right? You ever told your kid, no, <laughs> right? He said, don't go there. Don't go there. And instead of giving up, it's interesting when you look at the compass. It's interesting. They weren't allowed to go east. They weren't allowed to go north. They weren't allowed to go south. So they went west. So you see this picture that they kept on knocking. They were flexible. They had plans, but they weren't so focused on them that they wouldn't bend. Notice what happens. 
because they kept knocking on the doors, because they were intentional, because they were dedicated, because they were focused on what God would have them to do. Notice verse 9. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia to help us. When they had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course from Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for days. Now you say, now wait a minute, they hung out in Philippi for a few days? Yep. You know what happens later? You know the, a book in your New Testament that you're going to read? The book of Philippians, written to the church at Philippi. You see, God sovereignly orchestrating the events of their life, but they had to be flexible. They were sensitive to the Spirit's leading. Notice. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside of the to a gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. We sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. And notice, this is the first person saved in Europe. A lady by the name of Lydia, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. So you say, now Ron, why is that important? Do you see? They were intentional. They were focused on what God would have them to do. They were flexible. And because they were flexible, God had an appointment for them and for Lydia that they would have missed had they not listened. They could have pressed on and tried to keep going the other direction. But they would have missed the blessing of God. They would have missed the purpose of God. And this lady would have missed an encounter with God. God sovereignly orchestrated the events of their life. Well, let me give you one other thing quickly. When you think about Paul, not only was he intentional, not only was he flexible, would you all agree that Paul was a man who put his hand to the plow and was dedicated to get the job done? Did you see it? I love it. Go back over to 1 Corinthians 16. Notice what he says. But I will come to you after I go through Macedonia, if I'm going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may send me on my way wherever I may go. For I don't wish to see you now just in passing. For I hope to remain with you for some time if the Lord permits. Now notice, Paul has a vision. He says, listen, I need to go there. I've got to go do the work there. I've I've got to come to you. I've got to bless you. I've got to help you. But notice verse 8. I love it. But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. So you know what Paul's saying? I've still got work to do. I'm not leaving until the job is done. How many of y'all, I mentioned uh, unfinished projects on Sunday I want to give you an opportunity. Anybody here ever had an un- have an unfinished project? I mean, you start something that just didn't quite get finished. Paul said, listen, God called me to Ephesus. I've got a job to do. I need to finish. I don't need to quit. I'm going to remain at Ephesus until Pentecost. I love this idea. Paul is not just a person who plans. He's a person who does. He's not just a person who plans to do something, who hopes to do something, who wants to do something. Paul is a person who actually gets to work. So let me ask you a question. What is it that God has told you to do? What gift has God given to you? What calling has God placed on your life? You've got to be intentional. You've got to be flexible. And you've got to be dedicated to do it. What is it God's telling you to do? My prayer is, is that you get after it. Now, I would dive into this, but there's too much. Next week, we're going to see. Let, let me just read you this. I mean, there's just so much here. Notice, but I'll remain at Ephesus until Pentecost. You say, well, why? Listen to what he says. For a wide door for effective service has opened to me. And there are many adversaries. 
So next week, we're going to talk about the open doors that God has placed before us. And what do we do? Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for your grace. God, thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul, who was a man who was steadfast and movable, abounding in the work of the Lord, giving us an example that our labor is not in vain. Thank you for the difference that you've used him to make in the history of the world. A man who was a persecutor, who became a preacher. What a story. God, what, what great grace you demonstrate. Lord, thank you for the privilege we have to serve you. Thank you for the calling that you've placed on our life to love you and to love people. God, help us to, to not just meander through life without purposefully serving you, without leveraging opportunities that we have to share the gospel and do good to others. God, help us to be faithful. And God, help us to be fruitful. Lord, help us not to become so rigid in our own plans, in our own desires, in our own preferences, that we become inflexible, that we're not willing to, to bend, that we're not willing to, to compromise on non-essentials. Thank you for the example of Paul and Timothy, who met folks in the middle on things that didn't really matter. God, I pray that you'd help us to be committed to what you've called us to do in a day where the time, I believe, is running short. Raise up more and more men and women and young men and women and boys and girls who are committed to doing what you've called us to do. God, help us to work, to work as Jesus said, to work the works of you who sent us while we have opportunity. God, may we be busy. May we be faithful. May we be fruitful. May we be intentional. And God, help us to be flexible. I love you, Jesus. Go with us now. Keep us safe. Lord, please allow the storms to weaken and there to be no harm to anyone here in our area or beyond. I love you, Jesus, and I praise you in your name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great day. You're dismissed.